Thank you. Mrs. Borelli had said she wanted me to say a little bit about my background. So the Wilsons, uh, two different lines. The Wilsons were the ones here in 1849. The kilt that I wear is clan gun. Uh, Wilson is a separate clan gun. Um, they're some of the original homesteaders out in the White Rock, Folsom area. My great-great-grandfather was the assemblyman from Folsom in 1895. Um, and then to spend more time on the book than, than me, um, go all the way back on my mother's side of the family. They were Lowlanders, so they didn't have a kilt, um, but they were one of the original families at the old Bruton Parish Church in Williamsburg. Um, and my fifth great-grandfather was one of General Washington's officers, having served with him at Trenton Brandy. Wine, Monmouth was with him at Valley Forge for a winter. Um, and then another branch of that family uh, was actually from the area that we'll probably talk a lot about today, Orange County, North Carolina, out around the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. So there's probably a little bit of how I got interested in American history and colonial American history. The way I came across this subject actually had nothing to do with my ties to the Scottish community. It had everything to do with trying to get a good grade in a class because I was in an ethnic studies class. And we had a semester project on uh, how do you get a corporation to underwrite a grant. And we were told, you don't have to actually prove what you're trying to say. You just have to make it sound good enough a corporation would underwrite your grant. And um, being that it was an ethnic studies class, I was trying to cater to the teacher. And so I had always heard rights of Englishmen is the reason why we fought the revolution. But my two favorite founders were Sam Adams, who's Welsh, and Patrick Henry, who's Scottish. And so that here comes my good grade. And the more I tried to disprove my theory, the more that I found out there was evidence for it. So here we stand today, a long time afterwards. And I'm here to tell you that what we teach in school today about our rights coming from the 1689, quote, English Bill of Rights that then goes to the Magna Carta is wrong, for one thing. In 1689, it was a British Bill of Rights. It was passed by, the Eng it was passed by England in January, and it was passed by Scotland in April. So the, the version that we have today is really the fact that most of the writers in that time were either English or they came from Massachusetts Bay Colony, and that was a Congregationalist colony that then would repeat the English version of events. So, what I want to do today is, in a short amount of time as possible, I go over several hundred years of, years of history to show you that uh, the Scots actually, I would argue, made more of a contribution than the English did. And that sounds like heresy at this point. So let me take you uh, through that. Because one of the first things I did was ask myself this question when I was writing my thesis is that, well, how are you the first guy to find this after 200 years? You know, I mean, it seems kind of absurd to think 1700 and you come along in the year 2000 and you write this. And, and so trying to tie it in with the book, I have made an attempt to read these books. They're, they're long, but I'm on the fifth one, so I, I can't tie my speech into the, uh, the books a bit. There's a, a portion in Drums of Autumn where Brianna is deciding that she's going to go back and meet her dad and try and find her mom. And she's talking to all of her friends because uh, she's going to also go meet Roger. and. And so all of her friends say, hey, uh, you know, I wonder if he has an English accent. And she says, he's not an Englishman. I've told you he's a Scot. And uh, all her friends respond and they say, well, Scotland's part of England. I've looked on the map. And where she has to clarify, well, Scotland's part of Great Britain, not part of England. And I think if we're to recover where we came from and understand our form of government, the first thing we need to do as Americans is realized that English and British are not interchangeable terms. England is England. Great Britain was a free trade zone formed in 1707 that combines England with Wales with Scotland. So there's a lot about British history um, that we wipe away when we refer to Britain as England. Um, and that's how we've got the present uh, interpretation that we have today. So I want to go. First, let, let's talk about Jamie a little bit. Um, I think that'd be a good place to start. By the time you get into Voyager and Drums of Autumn, you start to see him come to the United States. And then eventually, as he's going into the United States, you see that he's going to take part in the revolution. There were people like Jamie in Scotland, but Jamie was an extremely rare Scot for his time. Maybe great for the book. But to give you an idea, in the 1715 Jacobite Rebellion, there were about 26 clans that took place, but took part of that. Only two of them were Catholic. Um, 
The British author Norman Davies, who wrote the book The British Isles, talks about when you that Britons did not really identify themselves by who or what they were. They identified themselves by what they were not. And he says what they were not was Catholic. So um, when you're looking at early Scottish history and early American history, Jamie doesn't really fit what we're talking about, about at the founding times or the philosophy that took place at the founding. And I think in order to get an idea of why, um, we need to go way far back and realize what Scotland was and what it was not. So when you're talking about ancient times, most of what you see in Europe today was conquered by the Roman Empire. There are a few countries that were never conquered by the Roman Empire. Wales was not, Scotland was not, Ireland was not, Sweden was not, Northern Germany, the Netherlands. They, they, none of those countries were um, conquered by the Roman Empire. And I think that's a very important point that nobody looks at nowadays because what you have in Europe in general is a consolidation of power where the government took control of everything. Um, they, they centralized government and tried, tried to dictate from the top down. And that's largely also even what they did in religion. So by the time you get to the Reformation and by the time you get to the emigration to the United States, Really what you're talking about is not religion. But there's a lot of people today that like to say that the fight in Scotland was Catholics versus Presbyterians, or the English Civil War was Catholics versus Protestants. It's the same old government fight between two government parties that you even see in the United States today. So for instance, if you look at Mary Queen of Scots, that absolutely destroys the stereotype of English or of uh, Catholic versus Protestant. The biggest supporter of Mary Queen of Scots was James Hepburn, the Earl, Earl of Bothwell, who was one of the biggest Protestant nobles there were. One of our biggest opponents was Gordon, Lord Gordon, who was a Catholic. So I think in order to understand where we're going with, with the formation of the American government, we really have to not think the way the history books have given us uh, certain histories whether it's that the English were the form of our government or that Scottish history is the story of Catholic versus Presbyterian, because in Scotland, really what it was, it was Presbyterian versus Episcopalian. Um, and it didn't always have a lot to do with theology. It always had a lot to do with were you a supporter of the government or not. I, I raised the question of did people pick their religion according to beliefs or did they pick their beliefs according to religion? And in ancient Scotland, you can't really tell. Basically, if you were an Episcopalian, you were a supporter of the government. If you were a Presbyterian, you were against the government. And in fact, the word that comes down to us, we all know that the founders were Whigs, which makes it amazing that, uh, you, that we actually teach that that's English, because Whig is a racial slur against the Scots. And so I think I'd like to start with the context of what Scotland was. It was never conquered by the Roman Empire. It was also the poorest country in Europe. Um, and so when you look at them being the poorest country in Europe and not giving into the power centers that the Romans brought and then the Saxons brought and then the Normans brought, you have a completely different culture develop in Scotland as from England. So the Romans come into England. London's original name was Londinium. It was, it's, a, it's a Latin name. There's not a single town in Scotland that can trace its name to a Latin origin. There's no Latin named cities in the entirety of Scotland. You had Hadrian's Wall for a reason. Um, when the Romans leave, their old mercenaries, the Saxons, come in. Well, the Saxons come, they slash, they burn, they burn down all the churches, they start murdering people left and right. They basically stamp education out. The author Russell Kirk points out that at that point in time, there's probably almost nobody that could read or write, except for a few leftover Romano Britons that had been spared as slaves, and that's only because they had been educated before. So what you have formed in England, and England is much smaller at this time than it is today, is the government controls every aspect of your life. And what you see in the Celtic countries is that government is not allowed to tell you virtually anything. The nobles hold control. The divine right monarch does not hold control. Um, and without trying to go into every single detail through all the centuries, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to jump forward a few centuries just giving you a few tidbits. Um, 
what happens, you've got a dark period once the Saxons leave. So about between 600 and 1100, you have almost no history. Um, you know the Viking invasion in 800, but there's very few things that we know solidly in that five, 600 year period. What we do see is coming out the back end around 1100, what they call the golden age of Scotland. So you have the Alexander Kings and they start trading with the Flemish traders across the channel and you've got money coming into Scotland. It's one of the few times when Scotland had money. Um, and so if you fast forward beyond that, you start getting to where the English are invading Scotland. They want to take Scotland over. So a good place to start is uh, April 6th of 1320. Today, if anybody knows what that date is, it's usually kilt day. There's a reason why it's kilt day. Um, the English king is coming into Scotland, murdering people, women and children included. And finally, the nobles of Scotland get together and they send a letter to the Pope, because the Pope is the one who has given the English clean jurisdiction over Scotland. And, they, and the nobles get together and they tell the, the Pope, you no longer have jurisdiction here, and since you don't have jurisdiction here, your English king doesn't have jurisdiction here either. And oh, by the way, we're electing Robert the Bruce our king. Most people don't think about that. In Scotland, the king was elected. And if you think about the time period of this is divine right monarch, when government controls everything, including your religion, where do the Scots get off telling the Pope that his king no longer has jurisdiction in Scotland? Well, there's a thing that comes out of the clan system uh, as they're reading in the Bible called covenant. And so what they do is through this idea called compact, the Scots take this religious idea of covenant and say, well, if God really created us all to be equal, then we have just as much right as anybody else to choose our leader. And you can start to see where this is going to lead by the time you get to the colonies. They say, we have just as much authority and jurisdiction as you do. Your king's gone. We elect Robert the Bruce to protect our rights. And oh, by the way, if he doesn't, we'll, we'll elect somebody else to replace him. So what you have in Scotland is a king by election. What you have in England is a king by divine right that controls everything. If, if you've read Robin Hood, I mean, one of the reasons why Robin Hood is a criminal is he shoots a deer. I mean, just wants to feed his people. Well, that's a crime because in England, everything is owned by the king, including that deer you just shot. Um, what happens once Robert the Bruce dies, and he dies with his son not quite of age, so you have a couple of Bruce kings, is then you have the Stuart family come in. And the Stuart family is everything about which the American Revolution was fought, and everything that the founders were against. So you have James I come along in the early 1400s. In 1424, he calls a couple of nobles before him. He murders them. He does not want the nobles checking his power in any way. And by 1425, he tries to create a state church. He wants a church in Scotland that he can control the same way all the other kings in Europe control the churches that are in their country. And this goes on for quite some time. You have, by the time you get to where Scotland is swallowed up by England to form Great Britain, you've got James VII of Scotland and James II of, of England. The whole history of the Stuarts is the history not of what you see today that's the Jacobite history of, oh, we support the Stuarts and they were our rightful kings, kind of like where Outlander starts. The vast majority of Scots were dead set against the Stuart family. And so by the time you get to marry Queen of Scots, you actually have the nobles of Scotland in the Treaty of Leith sign a treaty with Elizabeth of England saying the Stuarts no longer have jurisdiction here. Very different than what comes down to us through, through the history books today that would come out of Scotland because a lot of people left in Scotland are the Jacobites. So I think what we need to do in order to get through this in, in, in a simple amount of time is I'm going to give you a real shortcut that most historians don't give you. You've got Jacobite and you've got what will become orange. Orange men will at various times be known as Ulster Scots, Scotch-Irish, Whigs, um, Presbyterian Whig, Presbyterian. Jacobite often will be Catholic, vast majority of Scottish population. 
Um, they'll have a tendency to be more Tory because they support the crown. Um, and so as you come down through history, what you have is the nobles are going to be Presbyterian and they're going to check the power of the king, which the Stuarts end up hating. And so there are a, a couple of dates. I don't like to get too much into dates because that's what turns kids off to history. And everybody's like, oh, I've got to remember this date. I've got to remember that date. Basically what happens is you have the Declaration of Our Growth, and that sets the Scottish character for what they think government is a compact. It's where we, the people, come together because we have the moral authority to set our own government. It's not an accident that our Constitution starts with the phrase, we the people. That is direct, hearkening back to the Scottish idea of compact. Um, so, 1603 and 1707, that's the reason why I say I don't like dates, but there are dates that you really need to understand. In 1603, there ceases to be a Scottish crown, and there's now a British crown. The families come together. So for the first time, you'll hear people use English monarch, British monarch, all the, there's not a British monarch until 1603. That's, that, that's when the Stuarts come in and they also take the English crown. In 1707, after its economic war against the Scots, England ends up blackmailing Scotland and giving up its own representation. So in 1707, you have a union of the legislatures. And that's, I'm skipping a lot because we're talking about centuries, but I also want to get to Q&A and I also want to uh, make it more pertinent to the American Revolution and, and where I am now in the Galadon books. But um, in 1707, Scotland ends up now becoming part of Great Britain. And that's what most people don't think about. The old saying, there's nothing new under the sun. You want to talk about a lot of free trade treaties and everything that we do today? That's exactly what the formation of Great Britain was. It was nothing more nor less than the English trying to exert economic control over the British Isles. They blackmail Scotland into giving up its representation. That happens in 1707. And the reason why 1707 is so important is because of what happens 10 years before that and 10 years after that. In 1698, the greatest Scottish patriot there, that probably ever lived, William Wallace, possible exception, is a guy named Andrew Fletcher. Um, he's a guy that Thomas Jefferson said all of his ideas were in effect in the United States at the time of the founding, which raises the question, why do we not know who he is? Mm -hmm. So in 1698, he starts writing these discourses on government. And the reason being, you have Queen Anne on the throne. She's not going to have an heir. When she dies, it's going to put the Stuarts back on the throne. Nobody in Scotland wants this. Um, the National Presbyterian Church comes out against it. All the Scots are against it, the nobles are against it, and so Fletcher writes these discourses saying, I've got an idea. How about, instead of us having a Stuart king back on the throne when Queen Anne dies, what we'll do is we'll go back to our idea, idea of compact, we'll elect our own monarch. Um, but he also realizes that Scotland's the poorest country in Europe and won't necessarily have the money to fund its own military and defend itself because at the time in Europe what's going on is this idea of the universal monarchs which we never hear about anymore. Uh, Spain and France are trying to dominate the entire world. They're in the Netherlands murdering Calvinists there. They're in the Palatine in Germany murdering Lutherans there. Um, anywhere that they can go find somebody to murder that will stand up against their state church, that's what they're doing. And so Fletcher sees this, and he doesn't want Scotland to become a colony of England or of France or of anybody else in Europe. And so when he writes one of his other proposals is, we have to have a common defense. Scotland will have a militia, Ireland will have a militia, Britain will have a militia, and so will Wales. And then if anybody tries to attack the British Isles, we'll all come together in a common defense. Hmm, another phrase I seem to recognize from the Constitution. Um, but then, because he's afraid of tyrants like the Stuarts, he also puts another idea in there that everybody in the militia has to have the right to bear arms. So when you, by the time you get down to our Constitution, and you look at the right to keep and bear arms, and you look at the right, uh, or, or the idea of common defense, and the right to elect uh, your own ruler, all of those are ideas that eventually come down through the Presbyterians to a guy named John Witherspoon at Princeton, and John Witherspoon's uh, star student at Princeton is a guy named James Madison from Virginia who is the architect of our Constitution. Um, 
So as, as we look at these ideas, um, it's fine to say, okay, well, there's an idea, and you can go from this guy to that guy to this guy, and you can show that it was in Scotland in 1320, and it was in America in 1776. So I think it needs to be a little bit stronger than that. And the thing that, so the other thing that happens 10 years after 1707 that's so important is that before 1707, Scots were not citizens to the English. Scots were aliens. They were from a different country. In 1707, the Scots ceased to be English aliens, and they now become British citizens, and they now get all the rights of British citizenship. So after centuries of persecution, what do they do? What? We've got citizenship. We've got the British right of immigration. We're going to leave. We're going to get out of Dodge. Um, and so that's what they do. Um, to give you an idea, in the first federal census in 1790, in the American South, Celts outnumber Anglos by a 2-1 margin. It's not a story that you hear. It's not a story that we tell in our history books. Um, because we have a tendency to say like, oh, look at those old dead white guys. Um, well, we didn't like the English much more than anybody else did, so. <laughs> no. But um, when you look at that, there is a reservoir, and, and, and Winston Churchill points this out in his book, Age of Revolution. He says there's an economic war the English parliament carried out in the north of Ireland, and there is an influx of Scottish and Irish refugees that filled a reservoir of anti-English hatred colonies. Um, so that, so it's not that I'm the first guy after 200 years to figure this out. This has been known. We just don't teach it in our history books anymore. Um, and so what happens is, and I would have had an overhead, but I would have burnt out. So between 1707 and 1725, these guys flood in to Boston, because that's the main port of entry at that time. So much so that um, the people in Boston actually start burning down Presbyterian churches, and it creates a diaspora. Um, so back then, it was all Massachusetts Bay Colony, but today, what's Vermont, what's Rhode Island, or not Rhode Island, Vermont, um, New Hampshire, and Maine, were all the Scots that came in Boston and then left after their churches got burned down and they got beat up and all those other sorts of things. Um, and then also in early colonial history, the Scots had more of a tendency to be the fighters and so they settled on the frontier. The English were perfectly willing to have the Scots not in their cities, but out on the frontier where the Indians would attack them instead of their cities. And so what you have that, that, that starts forming on the outskirts, west of the Connecticut River in, in Massachusetts, and in what becomes Vermont, New Hampshire, and Portsmouth, um, and those areas, is a solid Celtic settlement that is perfectly happy to be away from government. Um, and then, after 1725, these people start coming into Philadelphia. And they start pouring into Philadelphia, but they don't get along with the Quakers. Quakers are a proprietary colony. Um, so they start taxing these people the way they want to, which is where you get the American idea of one man, one vote. Because by the 1740s in Philadelphia, there's this huge fight of these Scotch-Irish guys saying, you don't give us equal representation in the legislature, and now you're taxing us at an uneven rate compared to the citizens of Philadelphia. We demand one man, one vote. Um, so again, you start seeing in American politics where the Scotch-Irish are the source of, of these ideas that we have today. Um, what happens is the fight between the Quakers and the Scotch-Irish gets so bad, there's actually a case where a couple of Quaker judges go out and burn down a Scotch-Irish settlement. I mean, imagine if a Superior Court judge today said, I don't like you and where you live, and they knew who the judges were and they committed arson and the government did nothing about it. I mean, you'd all be appalled. It gets so bad that by 1764, there's an army of 6,000 Scotch-Irishmen from the frontier that march on Philadelphia and they're gonna burn Philadelphia down. Um, well, as you can imagine, when you don't get along with your neighbors, now the Palatinate and Germans start coming in, these guys are like, sell. And they start selling their property, the, the Palatinate Germans, and then they head down the wagon trail. And that's how Virginia is populated, how North Carolina is populated, how South Carolina is populated. Um, and it's just, so like today when we talk about the Pennsylvania Dutch, we all think that we know about it because we say, oh, well, they're not Dutch, they're German. Well, 
and then you'll hear people say, well, you know, I, I'm German and I'm Irish because I'm from central Pennsylvania. You're probably German and Scottish if you're from uh, Pennsylvania, uh, southern Pennsylvania, but because those are the people that sold to the Germans coming in. But that brings us to a point where we can tie it back to the book, is now that you're down the wagon trail, what you've got is you've got these pockets of fervent Whiggism. And when I say fervent, I, the, there's no place more fervent than North Carolina. So as they come down the wagon trail and you're in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia, I always kind of say that's the capital because that's where they first settled and that's where they were, the, they were most pure. But what happens in North Carolina is nothing less than a transplant of Scotland in the United States. And that's kind of where Drums of Autumn and, and the Fiery Cross, the book that I'm in now, that's uh, where where you really start to see Jamie coming in. But then again, Jamie's a little bit different. It's going to be interesting to me to see how she weaves him into the revolution because Jamie settles on the Camp, uh, Cape Fear River, which is where uh, a lot of the Highlanders settled. The only problem is that when that first started, the original name of Fayetteville was actually Campbelltown. And if you don't know Scottish history, uh, that won't mean much to you, because what happens after the Glorious Revolution in 1688 is William of Orange comes in, he demands uh, people be loyal to his crown, the Macdonald's message to him of their loyalty gets to him late, so he tries to have the Campbells slaughter the Macdonald's in a place called Glencoe, which uh, is something that Andrew Fletcher will talk about a lot through his career. But what happens is that if you realize that he's a Fraser. At that in 1767 coming to settle on the Cape Fear River, it's not his brethren that are there in 1767, it's the other guys. I mean, this place is named Campbelltown. It's as orange of a clan as, as you can possibly have. They were the ones that uh, William the Stadholder, now William of Orange, sent to wipe out McDonald's. So the people that are on the Cape Fear River this time aren't necessarily the Highlanders that would be friendly to Jamie. Um, so in the book, when you look at Cross Creek, that at the time he gets there is actually named Campbelltown. It's not until 1783 that it gets changed to Fayetteville after a Marquis de Lafayette. Um, so what happens in the revolution is starvation, because again, Scotland being the poorest country in Europe, starvation now starts sending the Jacobite Highlanders in mass out of the Highlands. Um, on the Isle of Lewis, people are actually cutting the throats of their cows and catching the blood to drink the blood because there's nothing and they need food and, and hydration at the same time. Uh, so the, almost the entire Isle of Lewis was they thought was going to be depopulated by the time that this was over. Um, these guys end up re-swearing their loyalty to the king and then settling in the Cape Fear River right up until 1775. So what you've got in North Carolina is an entire area of orangemen that now you get a big injection of Jacobite Highlander in the last 10 years before the revolution. So it might as well be any war in Scotland in the previous 300 years when you're talking about North Carolina. So I'm not far enough in the series to realize where she's taken that yet, but it'll be interesting to me to see the way that it develops because there was, an, so in the revolution there's a battle called King's Mountain where we finally get the best of the British Every single commanding officer at Kings Mountain was a Presbyterian elder. Um, so this is something that's been going on for hundreds of years uh, in Scotland. Bad blood is an understatement. These people obviously distrust government power because of what the English have done. They obviously don't accept government jurisdiction over their re religion as they showed in the Declaration of Arbroath in 1320. Um, and so as they come through the revolution, the revolution is nothing less than Presbyterian revenge on the crown. In fact, uh, there's a guy, and I'll just read it for you since there's a copy of my book up here. It's a Hessian Yeager Corps captain in 1778. And he's writing to his friends. He says, call this war, my dearest friend, by whatsoever name you may, only call it not an American rebellion. It is nothing more nor less than an Irish-Scotch Presbyterian rebellion. And you see Horace Walpole, who's the son of the old prime minister, he says, because America's run off with the Presbyterian parson, and that is the end of it. As you, this was not a secret at the time of the revolution. That's just something that the later historians have chosen to ignore. And so 
when you talk about the American regiments, you want to talk about the Overham Mountain Men. They're the Scotch Irish men that settled illegally past the King's Proclamation line in 1763 over into Tennessee. The Kentucky Rifles obviously are from Kentucky. You talk about the Pennsylvania line, they're the men from the southern Pennsylvania uh, colonies. And I think one of the ways, without going through every regiment and every commander, uh, is that take our understanding of Bunker Hill today. Yes, that, that was all Massachusetts Bay Colony at the time, but it wasn't Bostonians that stood there in front of the uh, British Army. The people that were on Bunker Hill were the orange men from what is today Londonderry, New Hampshire. They're under uh, General John Stark, they're under Israel Putnam, who was one of the, the, the guys that the Scotch-Irish had trained during the French and Indian War. The guys that stood there as the British soldiers were coming up Bunker Hill, were all Scotch Irishmen from Londonderry, and they, and they let them have it. When they ran out of ball shot, they put the powder in and threw nails in their rifles, and then shot the nails at them. Anything that they could possibly do to kill a red coat and take revenge after centuries is what they did. So, out of the 450 casualties of the American forces, only like 79 of them were these guys, because they had spent years in the highlands and the lowlands. Years on the frontier in America, they developed guerrilla tactics. Um, and the British, all through the war, were known as complaining about our ungentlemanly way uh, of fighting. You know? Well, if fighting like a gentleman means putting on a big red clown suit, putting a big white X on the front saying, shoot here, I'm glad <laughs> that uh, we, we did not fight as gentlemen. Um, and you see that in the Battle of Saratoga. Daniel Morgan's riflemen, who are the Presbyterians from Western Virginia, they go up there and they sit in the trees, and the British Army marches onto the field, and just, there's an X, boom, there's an X, boom. And they basically took out every artillery officer. One of the reasons why the British couldn't use artillery at the Battle of Saratoga is we sniped all their artillery officers. There was one company that had 400 men in it, 360 of them fell to the sniper. That's the reason why the British didn't like the way we didn't fight like gentlemen, but I'm kind of glad we didn't. Um, I was in the military. I don't want to have a big X wherever I'm running on, on my person. Um, so that takes you through the battles of the revolution. But then I think the very important thing is when we're talking about the government, you start talking about the Declaration and you start talking about the Constitution. If you look at the Declaration, there's a point in which Thomas Jefferson said that a prince who operates under these premises and operates as a tyrant, he basically that he deserves to die. Um, and I always ask my friends, was, was Jefferson like tired because he stayed up the night before and he was cramming for the final? I mean, we all know this is addressed to King George. Why would he say a prince that thusly acts like a tyrant? What, has Jefferson gone off his rocker? No. Everybody in the colonies, in the backwoods, whether it's from South Carolina all the way up to Pennsylvania, or the guys up in Londonderry, wherever they are, they know exactly what he's talking about. Because in 1585, George Buchanan, who was the tutor to one of the James Stewarts, wrote a treatise called De Uri Regni Apud Scotos, which roughly translated as the law of the kingdom of the Scots basically said that since we no longer operate under divine right, we no longer operate under the Pope, we can choose our own leaders, that when we choose our own leaders, if that leader becomes a tyrant, we not only have the right, but we have the duty to kill the tyrant. And he referred to that guy as the prince. And then he, so if any of you have read John Locke, when I was in college, the thing that really bugged me is I'd open up John Locke and I'd look and he'd say, well, this is an answer to the infamous Robert Filmer. And I thought, well, Robert Filmer might have been uh, famous in 1690, but this is 1990. So um, Robert Filmer basically answered George Buchanan. John Locke, Algernon Sidney, and a guy named Campbell, whose book I haven't been able to get a hold of, they were all answering. Filmer saying, no, Buchanan was right in the first place. And this is what the Presbyterians teach in the school system all the way down to 1776, and it's what John Witherspoon is teaching at Princeton. Give you an idea, 11 of the people of the Constitutional Convention went to Princeton. Um, so it wasn't just like one guy, James Madison. It was Madison was one of many. Well, when Jefferson writes that the prince acting as a tyrant, he's hearkening all the way back to 1585 and all the education the Presbyterians have gone through 
all the way to 1776 when he writes this. People in the colonies know what he's talking about. It's a cultural reference that's fully understood. Today we read it and say, like, okay, he referred, he referred to King George to the Prince. No, he wasn't. He, he was hearkening back to the idea of compact that had existed in Scotland for centuries. Um, and so by the time you get to the Constitutional Convention, you see that the division enumerated powers. John Witherspoon at Princeton taught that you could never enumerate people's rights because whatever you forgot to list would be left out and would be considered a right. So Madison took that. He said, wait a minute. If people's rights can be limited by enumerating them, government's authority and jurisdiction could be limited. So he inverts the Witherspoon uh, lecture, and instead of limiting people's rights, he limits the government's jurisdiction. Then he takes Fletcher's proposal of common defense, you know, that, and the right to keep and bear arms. And if you go through the, the, the Bill of Rights, all 10 of those amendments, except for amendment number nine, were all requested by the areas of Scotch-Irish settlement. You look, Virginia requested, North Carolina requested, the southern counties of Pennsylvania, and they did break off for the purposes of the uh, Constitution. Southern counties of Pennsylvania broke off from the main part of Pennsylvania and made their own sets of demands. Um, so it's probably the only Federalist state in which we have a clear anti-Federalist record, because amazingly, all the anti-Federalist record from states like Delaware and Georgia are missing. Um, so when you look at the First Amendment, it's clearly the state church versus we have the right to choose our own God. When you look at the Second Amendment, it's Andrew Fletcher. If you go all the way through these Bill of Rights, it's solidly based not in the idea of divine right that the king controls everything and can dictate everything in your life. It's clearly based on the idea of compact and that we rule ourselves. Um, and so, you know, I, I think at some point um, I'd like to get to Q and A. I'm not sure that you guys would too at some point. So anytime you guys have a question, just raise your hand because when you're talking about centuries of, of uh, history, you could probably talk for 24 hours. I don't think I want to talk that long. I don't think you guys want to hear me talk that long. So um, any, at, at any time you guys have a question, just raise your hand. Um, Sure. Um, I don't understand exactly how the judgment was made as to what, well, okay, Scotland was the poorest. What was that based on? How much food they had or cattle or what? You know, at this point, I think it's, I, I think it's probably the number of people that starved at any one time. I mean, it's, uh, they, Okay, there's so one of the main things that they would talk about is in 1698. 1698 is a big year we don't know about. It's right before Union. But Scotland was poor enough that all the people in Scotland that had enough money pulled all their money. I mean, the entire country pulled its money, and they tried to set up uh, a colony because all the other European powers were making a bunch of money off of trade. So they decided, well, we need some money at some point. We're going to... So they go down to Panama and try to establish the uh, city of Darien so they can have a, a trading outpost in the New World so they can start to generate revenue like the other countries. So I don't think they probably have the same numbers that we have today. Well, this is gross national product and this is domestic product and all that. But it was obviously desperate enough that they pulled their money as a country and then the Darien Expedition fails. Almost everybody in the Darien Expedition dies. And that's also what allows the English blockade, because they try and prevent Scotland from trading with the Flemish traders over on the continent, who had traditionally been their best trading partners. So between the failure of the Darien Expedition draining all the money out of the country, and also the English engaging in this blockade to make sure what little income they had was now not going to be, that's how they're actually able to that, force the Scots to give up their own representation. Um, so how they kept all that, the, did they keep the same kind of uh, numbers that we keep today where you have the department of whatever? So, no, they don't. But even today's numbers aren't that accurate. Like unemployment figures aren't actually the number of people unemployed. It's only the number of people that still want or that are still getting unemployment benefits. I mean, once once you run out of unemployment benefits, somehow the government thinks you're magically employed because you're no longer in the unemployment figures. It's like, no, that's not the way it works. It means you're not giving them unemployment benefits anymore. Um, 
So I think when you look at the way that universities and economies and colonies, I, I don't know how they quantified every, everything at the time, but obviously Scotland didn't have the same number of colonies or anything else. And in fact, because the Stuarts got so mad at the Presbyterians, what was going to be what their colony, New Scotland or Nova Scotia that's now in Canada, he just gives it to the French. I'm tired of you guys. I'm giving your colony away to the French. Um, so they don't, I don't think they had the hard numbers the way we do today, but uh, I'm a big fan of the ben Benjamin Disraeli's quote, the old uh, uh, British Prime Minister, that their lies are damned lies and their statistics. Um, because that's what a lot of our statistics are today. But when you look at the, the, the poverty in comparison to other European countries, um, I think that's probably where they come up with it. It's probably accepted. So maybe if somebody could go back in time, they might say Iceland was poor or something, but I don't even know if it was settled then. So <laughs> you had a question. Yeah, would, would you say the uh, war now between England and Spain would be equivalent to Presbyterian against Catholic, or is that more political, actually? Um, I think there's several answers to that question. Um, I, well, I had one teacher that talked about the English being so traumatized by the English Civil War, which I often use as a point to show that how the English wrote the history is because Oliver Cromwell's real name was Oliver Williams. So you've got a Welshman named Oliver Williams versus a Scotsman named Stuart, but it's the English Civil War. So, um, but regardless of, of, of whether we call it English Civil War or British Civil War, which I prefer because that's the true form, is that um, people are really right now trying to erase the religion aspect out of it. So if you, if, if you got rid of historical revisionism, I'd say that's, it's really more Presbyterianism versus Episcopalianism. I mean, today, people, and you're, I always got to be careful on this because you know some people will be like, well, why don't you like that group? It's not that I don't like that group or do like this group. It's just I think in order for us to understand our history, we need to understand what the true sides were. No, it wasn't Presbyterian versus Catholic. It was Presbyterian versus Episcopalian. When you drive down the road, you don't see the Scottish Catholic Church on the side of the road. You see the Scottish Episcopalian Church on the side of the road. So I don't think people still say it that way today because people are trying to get away from religion, except when they want to criticize it, then they're like, oh, it's those religious people that did it. So, but I also think that that has blurred our, and why we don't really understand where we're coming from, because if you were to ask someone, what is Presbyterianism? Oh, well, that's this sect of Christianity. Presbyterianism really is a big clue as to the way things happen. So the theology, Presbyterianism is not a theology. The theology of the Presbyterian Church and the Congregationalist Church were both Calvinism, which is why the state church hated them. But the important thing to realize of what Presbyterianism was is it's a form of church government, and it's a form of church government that married the clan, that mirrored the clan system. So because these were people that had never been conquered by the Romans, had not been conquered by the Saxons, had not been conquered by the Normans, and they believed in controlling their own destiny and governing themselves, they came up with a form of church government where the church could govern itself rather than be governed by the state. So Presbyterianism has nothing to do with theology. It's do you believe the state should control my church or do you believe the people in the community should control uh, their own churches? Well, what happens is one of the James Stewarts dies in, uh, early on and he leaves uh, the kingdom to his son who's not old enough to rule. So in that case, you have a regent that steps forward and governs in the place of the minor until that minor is old enough. Well, there's a guy named Cardinal Beaton, and he just starts murdering Presbyterians left and right because they won't give in to the state church. All those people go down to Cambridge um, because they want to get away from it. And they spread this sedition of Presbyterianism through Cambridge. Um, and then Bloody Mary Tudor comes in and as one author has put, started devoutly burning Protestants. Well, at this, at, at this point, they, they kill Cardinal Beaton and the Presbyterians go back north into Scotland, but they've left this Presbyterian ideal in Cambridge. Well, what happens then is the British or the English monarch is too powerful 
and won't let presbyteries exist. So the form of church government that takes place in England, if you're Calvinist, is you rule your congregation, or you rule your church by congregation government. Well, that's what congregationalism is. So congregationalism has nothing to do with theology. Presbyterianism has nothing to do with theology. And so there are forms of church government that say, we will control ourselves and the state won't dictate our church. Well, when you realize those things, and then you look at the First Amendment, which says, there shall be no established state church. It's not what the media tells you of separation of church and state. It says, there will be no established church. It's hearkening right back to the fight that the Congregationalists had in England, and that the Huguenots had in France, and that the Presbyterians had in Scotland, and that the Swiss and, and uh, Calvinists and the Dutch Calvinists had in their two countries. Um, so no, people, I don't think they describe it that way today, because they, that's not something you can put in a sound bite. And besides, people want you to think that anybody who had anything with religion is crazy, and so they don't want to advertise that. But it's the only way to truly understand what happened, because you know Presbyterianism and, and Congregationalism were not straight religion. The Calvinism was, was their theology. But there's a reason why you were a Presbyterian church, and the fact that you have Congregationalism rise in England would be something that a Calvinist would tell you is just another testament to the fact that the English king controlled too much. There's a reason why Presbyterianism could never take hold, because the, the divine right monarch in England was too powerful, and, and the nobles wouldn't fight against that in England the way the nobles in Scotland fight against. I mean, these people couldn't have done anything in Scotland without the backing of the nobles. It was the nobles versus Mary, Queen of Scots, and it was the nobles versus the Stuart monarchs that allowed Scotland to continue to have its own culture. Yes, sir? What is the St. Andrews of the title of your book? Who or what is that? Um, since in school we teach that, so, Every part of Britain has its own patron saint. So Wales is David, England is George, uh, Andrew is Scotland. So it's basically when, when I'm challenging the predominant theory that we teach in schools of Magna Carta to English Bill of Rights, really British Bill of, Bill of Rights, I want everybody to learn that, down to the Declaration and our Bill of Rights, that, that's not from the tradition of England and St. George at all. It's really the tradition of compact. So it's really a reference to Scotland, but I didn't know with Scotland's American Revolution would make sense. So it was just something I was looking for at the time that I wrote my thesis. Do so. you have a question? I just thought maybe you could talk a little bit more about how everybody was having all this trouble in Scotland. They come down, they go in at Boston, they go in at Philadelphia, they make their way out to this buffer area you're talking about. Uh, okay. They've got all this space there. You would think the pressure would be off in that pressure cooker. So what is the catalyst, if there is one, that does ultimately send us into revolution? Why does that pressure cooker keep getting pressure? Um, I think just because of centuries of being fed up. Um, there's a, since there's so much stuff to talk about in a short time, one of the concepts I didn't hit but plays very big in my book is that when you look at the way the Romans, Saxons, and Normans came in, I'm obviously not the first one to write on that, so there's a guy named Russell Kirk who wrote a book, America's British Culture, and he talked about the way culture formed in Britain and how in the Celtic societies it was more of a natural uh, local decision versus, say, in the Norman areas where it was not a local decision, and T.S. Eliot talks about the way English culture formed, but Russell Kirk points out that there are many parts, it's what he labeled the Celtic frame. So today, Devon is a county in England. At the time, Devon was a Celtic country. Um, so if you take Devon and you take Cornwall and you take Wales and you take uh, Scotland, it's what he called this Celtic frame. So, you, so if you look at Britain and, and the Romans come in, they don't get all the way to these back areas, much less to Ireland. Um, and so because of the difference in the way the culture forms, the way they settle because in the, in the Americas, because the English are perfectly happy to have a buffer between them and the Indians. In fact, uh, my, my favorite way that it's phrased is the first uh, Ulster historian, he died before he finished his book, but you know we think of Londonderry and, and Northern Ireland as settled by the English, and as he points out, the English were too tenderly bred to want to settle there themselves. What they did is they went to the Presbyterians in Scotland and said, 
we'll stop murdering you if you'll go settle the plantation in Northern Ireland. And they were like, oh, well, semi-religious toleration without murder. Okay, maybe we'll go. And so that's the way the Scots get back to Ireland. And when I say back to Ireland, it's because the Scoti were originally a coastal Irish tribe that, that went to Scotland. Um, and so the old joke is that, is that what is a Scotsman? He's an Irishman that can't swim, because obviously he couldn't swim back to his home. But, um, and so um, as they get into America, the same thing starts happening is that you've got Boston. Well, then what happens? You've got Maine, you've got New Hampshire, you've got Vermont, and in upstate New York, there's, that's where all these guys go to get away from the government. Well, you, you're starting to see that fringe again. So in my book, I, I raised the point that you have a Celtic fringe here in the United States, too. The English and the powerful people, people with money, the traders, they settled on the coast. So like if you look at um, South Carolina, if you look at the coast of Carolina, very Episcopalian. You got St. John's Parish, St. Michael's Parish, Saint, you know, St. Whatever's Parish, all part of the Episcopal Church. Then you get inland and you've got like the Waxhaw settlement where Andrew Jackson and, and those guys were born. And so what you have is you have a fringe in America the same way you had a fringe in Britain, um, where you have almost two different societies form. And these guys highly resent that the people that still view is what they view as English life. Like we think, oh, Boston Massacre, and then finally exploded not a few years later to 1776. Well, James Otis gives his Boston court speech in 1761. The king lays down his proclamation line in 1763. And the first thing the Scotch Irish do is like, what king, just, just the way a little kid does with parents, you said don't go beyond this line, so what did the Scotch Irish do? They go, into, they go into Tennessee and Kentucky because the king said, don't settle past this line. Well, you're the king, and you know what we Presbyterians think of you. We're settling across the line just to show you you're not boss. And, I mean, Lexington, Kentucky is named Lexington, Kentucky because the group of Scotch-Irishmen that were illegally over in that territory, when the shot heard around the world was fired at Lexington, they said, yes, somebody shot the king's troops. We're naming our settlement Lexington. Lexington was named by a bunch of them guys that were defying the king and the only better way they could have thought to celebrate it was to name it after the place where a red coat got shot. Um, so, you know, it sounds kind of foreign to us today because we don't study this anymore, but these were fervent people that had had it after centuries of persecution. Um, and it, even if you look at a lot of the stereotypes today, it always fits the, I mean, what, well, the wild Highlander. Okay, yeah, I'm sure the Highlanders did some wild things too. But, you know, you've got, when you look at Scotland, there's no, that's never referred to as a common culture and a common people with a common set of ideas. It's the wild Highlander that you might want to put in a zoo rather than come face to face with. You want to see it, but you don't want to get close enough to touch it. And then the lowlanders are all these guys that were mostly like the English anyway, and they just opened businesses. Way oversimplified, and I don't think it's accurate. I'm sure you can find a guy in Strathclyde somewhere that was like an English trader. I'm sure you could find a wild Highlander, but you know, it's just like today. You could find almost any sort of person in any way in any community around here. You can't say, well, the people from Elk Grove are like this, and the people from Natomas are like that. Um, but yet there's probably people in both those communities that would fit whatever you'd come up with as a, as a stereotype. So, um, in 1763, the Queen has a proclamation line. By 1764, there's open warfare in the United States, which most people don't realize. In North Carolina, where, where Jamie, you know, you see it in the book where they're like, Jamie, you got to put together a militia to get rid of the regulators. Regulators weren't just some little thing. The regulators uh, had been taken advantage of by, by business types, and it wasn't just in North Carolina, it was in Virginia too. When Patrick Henry becomes famous, one of his early uh, famous speeches is that all these guys came in and talked to all the Scotch-Irish farmers out on the frontier into growing tobacco. Well, you have too much tobacco, you've got a glut of supply, prices come crashing down, now all the creditors are gonna come in and they're gonna take everybody's farm. Well, in North Carolina, where they're really, really Scottish, okay, fine, you can be a creditor, you can try and protect my farm, but I'm gonna shoot you instead. And the regulators weren't just a bunch of rebels that felt like creating things, they felt they had been taken advantage of um, by these speculators. And so there's actually a debate in the House of Burgesses in Virginia 
And it would be amazing to see Patrick Henry uh, after all these mortgages and everything if, if he were in today's society, because we're like, well, should we bail out the bank? Should we bail out this? Should we bail? They were gonna bail out all the tobacco people that had gotten all these people to speculate tobacco. And Patrick Henry gets up and he said, uh, so let me get this straight. It's now my responsibility to uh, bail out the losses of the spendthrift. Uh, you know, basically saying, you took the gamble, you lost the money. Why is it now up to me as the taxpayer to bail you out? I mean, I would have loved to see Patrick Henry versus the Capitol in 2008. <laughs> because, uh, you know, it's, um, so when you, when you look at that, the, there is open warfare through the 1760s. And by the time you get to 1772, in Rhode Island, which is about the least Scottish you can get, but it tells you how much the idealist Whiggism has spread. In 1772, the Whigs that are in Rhode Island go steal a custom schooner. So I'm assuming it's a custom schooner. It's an official government ship. A custom schooner out of bank, and they burn it. I mean, imagine somebody going out to Norfolk or San Diego today and sinking an American carrier. I mean, Diane, I'm not suggesting that. I'm not advocating that. I am a Navy veteran. But I'm just, you know, people, we have a tendency to read history books and be like, oh, yeah, you know, this happened. You know how much pe trouble those people were going to be in? And this is one of the ideas where we get right a jury trial in the Bill of Rights. The king knows that even though his custom schooner has been burned and destroyed, which anywhere else would be an act of war, that if he has a jury of peers that are Whigs in the United States, they're going to acquit the people that burned the ship. So he tries to have them deported to England so they can be tried in front of a jury of Tories rather than a jury of Whigs. So these are the things. So yeah, 1776, a lot happens. But it's not just something like they woke up one day and said, all right, we're ready to be done with it. Let's go fire at Monroe's tap. It's, this is something all the way through the 1760s that is happening. And you, you know, we might hear about the Boston Massacre a few years before, but these people are already openly firing on the King's troops in the mid-1760s uh, at the time of the Stamp Act and other things. And you know, James Otis is 1761, so we're talking about a buildup of at least 14 years. You're talking also in 1764, besides the Regulator War breaking out, you've got the Scotch Irishman from Pakistan from Paxton, which I think is today Harrisburg, but I'm not real good on my Pennsylvania geography, but I think it's today Harrisburg, but at the time it was Paxton. Got an army of 6,000 Scotch Irish marching to burn down Philadelphia in the same year that the regulators are firing on the King's troops in, in North Carolina. So, um, you know, this, this is the powder keg that's there that we don't normally cover, but I think when you're trying to put it in a, in a school book, you, Try to make it as easy for people as possible so they can answer the multiple choice question. But it doesn't give you the full picture of what was happening in the colonies at the time. And, you know, and so there is this Celtic fringe that takes place in the United States. And that's probably also the reason why the first ones to line up at Bunker Hill will be like, all right, it's on now, let's go. So your book doesn't look like enough to describe all this. <laughs> I try, you know, I. It's funny, I actually wrote this several years ago, and a radio show host called me up and he said, let me have you on. I've, this thing has been sitting for a long time because I've been thinking, how do I come up with a literary device to make it more readable and this and that? And the guy said, I've got all these calls. you got to just publish the book. So this is very short and concise and takes you through it very quickly. The analogy that I've used is today in universities, we all know John Locke in the Second Treatise of Government, but the guy who really wrote and put everything down was Algernon Sidney, but that means John Locke's 200 pages and Algernon Sidney's almost 700. So unless you really, really want. So does this have every single thing in it? No, but it takes you from, and then you'll really think it's too small. It takes you from the first mention of Scotland with the curricula in 80 AD, because um, when Scotland's the 17 little principalities, all the way to the end of the Constitutional Convention. Um, but that could get a little tedious going through James the first and the second and the third. So there's, I, I've tried to hit more of the high spots just to give people the idea of where it goes. And it's more on the Declaration and the Constitution because I think that would be of more interest to an American audience. Um, 
So I tried to go as deep as I could without putting people to sleep every 10 pages. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, and maybe it's not very interesting in American history, and I was wondering if you've ever thought of you know, taking your knowledge of uh, American history and making your own historical fiction and so that uh, a series. Because uh, I see, you know, I watch a lot of British or English, or I'm not sure what to say now. One <laughs> <laughs> masterpiece theater, and that's historical, and they're fascinating to watch. And we have very few shows in America about our own history, and it's fascinating. I've thought about it. I've got, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I've thought of the historical fiction route, but when I was trying to do this, I thought, could I make, what I was trying to do with this, and then when the guy said, just get it in print, because people need to hear this, I, I was trying to think, how do I write this book while making it as entertaining as historical fiction without it actually being fiction? So. Um, I'm always thinking, yes, I've thought of those things, and then I've seen like what Ken Burns has done with his documentaries, and I know a couple of people that write, and I thought, well, maybe, maybe it could go to Ken Burns' History Channel oh, documentary. Because, um, you know, there's some really, and then how do you show the precursor here to, I mean, the stuff is entertaining, and, and it's, that's not the important part. If it's entertaining, people remember it. And I think that's why we have so many problems with kids. Well, it's such and such a date and such and such a year. <laughs> and you wonder why kids hate history. Now, back that up and take the establishment of the state church and, and all the wars and the other, other things that happened, and then go back to Scotland uh, around 1580 when you've got the Stuarts trying to impose divine right monarchy in Scotland, but the, but the nobles and the people are still too independent minded. And Andrew Melville walks up to King James and he grabs him by the knees. You are God's silly vassal. I mean, imagine if anybody, even without criticism, tried to grab the President of the United States today. <laughs> if you lived, what would the Secret Service do to you? I mean, if, if you put it into the context of today's, if, if you took those events and put them in the context of today and thought about what people's reactions would be today, we, even if those of us who love the revolution, love what it stood for, think that it's given us the greatest country on the face of the earth, even, until you sit and you think about that, wow, it's even more revolutionary than you realize. I mean, to go up to a guy that believes he's a divine right monarch that has everything in the country in his control, and you just grab him and shake him like you do your kid, like, what were you thinking? Why did you throw the baseball through the window? But this is for the monarch of your country. And that monarch realizes there's nothing he can do because he sees the array of nobles behind him and says, we're going to stand for Scotland, and we're going to stand for Scotland's culture, and we're going to stand for our rights as human beings the way that God made us. And you can take your European continental ideas and go back to France if you'd like. You know, we don't think of that. I mean, any TV show that you made today where somebody just strolled into this Oval Office and physically grabbed the president, we, that's not even realistic. But these are the kind of things that were happening then, and why, probably a lot of the reason why people thought Scotland was such a wild country and, and was so out of line, because we didn't put up with things that the continental Europeans did. Um, you should get hold of Netflix or something. <laughs> I've thought about it, but I guess I'm at the point on that, the same way I'm with this. It's like, well, how can I make it perfect? I just, I guess I have to accept that it won't be perfect before then, just meet with the right people and, and go from there. This has been something I've been talking to him about since that HBO series on Adams. Oh, really? I need to do this. I didn't listen to the wife. Is that the parallel thing? I mean, it's And, you know, John Adams, I love John Adams. It was amazing to me. Um, and you can tell that David McCullough must have retained something on because there's a thing when there, there's a moment when she the Deckler, uh, going to write the declaration, um, should we peel off from Britain or not? in which John Adams tears into Jonathan Dickinson for his Quakerism. And I was like, that is the way that it was then? The Quakers and the Scots hated each other? I realized Adams is Massachusetts and Congregationalist. And so, but I was just amazed because we censor so much 
now, because we want to think that everything at the founding was perfect, we all held hands and sang kumbaya, and that there was never a disagreement. There was a war in which many people died. There were agreements, and there were, there were loyalists, uh, you know, that if you look at like one, one of the popular stories with Scottish people is that you know Fiona McDonald or Flora McDonald, who had helped, which and this is one of those things from my plan, help tried to help the pretender land back in Scotland. The Jacobites would call him Bonnie Prince Charlie. Um, they uh, um, I forgot where Flora. Was. Flora. So she comes over and they're like, look how look how um, Scottish that. North Carolina is, it's where Flora McDonald settled. When I say it was Scotland transplanted in North Carolina, you know where they ended up going, it was Canada. Once the revolution was over, the Orangemen didn't put up with the Jacobites at all. There's a reason why there's so many Scottish names in Canada. Um, so there was not kumbaya, it was not, it's like, all right, you guys tried to stick it to us for centuries, we finally stuck it to you. If you know what's good for you, you'll get out. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, but I mean, she didn't stay in North Carolina, and so when you look at when you look at the animosity that must have existed in, in North Carolina, when you get that influx of Highlanders, Jacobite Highlanders, that just reaffirmed their fealty to the to the British king, set in the middle of all these people that wanted to do nothing more than shoot the king, um, it gives you an idea of like how things were back then. Yes, sir. Well, so it, it, it appears there's a lot of Presbyterian type thinking in the development of the Declaration and the Constitution. Right. The founding fathers were some of them, any of them, all of them Presbyterian. But you said Adams was a Congregation. Right? right. One of the things. So, so remember the Congregational Presbyterian forms of church government, um, but the underlying theology was Calvin. So. The way that I break it down for my friends when they're like, we're having beers and they want to show interest but they don't want a big long dissertation, is this is the shortcut that I give them. If you go back in time, to that time, Presbyterian is Gallic for Calvinist, Congregationalist is English for Calvinist, Huguenot is French for Calvinist, and then hopefully Swiss and Dutch Calvinist are self-explanatory. So, the theology of all of them was largely the same. The reason why the state churches hated the Calvinists so much is well, when I talked about Andrew Melville, he's there with the two kingdoms theory. The kingdoms, the two kingdoms theory is that there are two kingdoms on earth. There's the kingdom of Christ and there's the kingdom that you live in. And that the king of the one here on earth is not the king of the one in heaven. He's just any other old vassal and he gets to heaven. All the Calvinists believe that to an extent. It, it might not have been written down in theory the way that it was in Scotland, but none of them believed in divine right monarchy. Um, and so maybe not everyone was a member of a Presbyterian church, but that doesn't mean that that, uh, that idea didn't go out there. So the real divide is between the Episcopalians on one side and Presbyterian Congregationalists. And I haven't looked at the theology of the Welsh Baptists, but it's really the Celts versus the Episcopal Church is the easier way to, to divide that. So um, John Adams wasn't as far over as Samuel Adams, but yeah, a lot of them, because Presbyterian, the term used to be Presbyterian Whig, and where the term Whig came from is keeping in mind what a big insult, to, to understand how big of an insult this is, you have to keep in mind how poor Scotland They've lost the complete etymology of the word, but Whig is from the old Gallic Whigamore. And Whigamore is something along the lines of a cattle thief. So imagine you're in the poorest country in Europe and somebody steals your cow, what you think of that blankety blank, 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 right? So Whigamore, Whig is short for Whigamore, and it is the racial slur that the English used against the Scots in their uh, from, well, from what was originally their native language. And so the idea of, even if they weren't Presbyterians, these guys were Whigs. So like you look at Benjamin Franklin, he was raised a Presbyterian, but Franklin couldn't latch on to Calvin's predestination theory. So he was still raised in the tradition of Whiggism, probably still had a lot of those ideas, 
but couldn't deal with all of Calvin's theology, so he wasn't actually a Presbyterian. But he was still raised with those ideas. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily they say they were all Presbyterians, but the ones that were Whigs all have this this coding of Presbyterian Whiggism on them, even if they ended up going to a Baptist church. Because keeping in mind that it's a government, a form of church government, what happens in the South, and they'll be like, oh, okay, now that you said that, that makes sense. In the South, they're Baptist, there's lots of Baptists, right? We all talk about the Southern Baptists. Well, since Presbyterianism is a church of form, a form of church government, and the Scots, did, the, the Presbyterian Church of Scotland did not come over here, you have no presbyteries form in the South. So they all become Baptist and Methodist. Well, how many Baptist and Methodists are there today in the South? There's a lot of them. The reason why they're not Presbyterians today is because the Scottish Presbyterian Church never made the attempt to export the form of church government. So you have a Presbytery in Boston in 1745 and a couple of others. I think you have a Grafton Presbytery somewhere in the backwoods. But they never get, ironically, they never get beyond Boston the way all the settlers did. So what's more important is realizing they're Whigs because lots of Presbyterians, I will still tell you to this day that I'm a Scotch-Irish Presbyterian Whig. I don't go to a Presbyterian church. Um, so in your question, Presbyterians specifically no. The Whigism that was born out of Presbyterian, I'd say absol that's absolutely, absolutely correct. What about George Washington? Is this, uh... George Washington um, was, there's, depending on what he looked at is what he relied on, and I actually cover Washington in my book because one of the things that I think we miss now is that culture is more important than race. One of the things that really derailed us in the 1800s is a lot of the historical writers, it's the time of Darwin, and they start writing from a Darwinian point of view, and so race becomes incredibly important. And um, you'll even see some of the Scotch-Irish writers, oh, we've got no Irishness whatsoever. We're, we're pure 100% Scottish. You know, if I'm an oldster and the girl across the street is really hot, I'm not going to say I'm not asking you out because you're Irish. There is some mixture. I'm sorry. I mean, I don't, don't care if you want to believe in the race pure blood theory or not. The girl, she looks good. You're going to ask her out. So um, I think that's a lot of Darwinian garbage. Did. So Washington was from what the borders area. There's England, which was completely Roman, Saxon, Norman, and, and the king held power there. And then there's the highlands where the clan chief. There's an area called the borders. And I probably shouldn't say too much about the book since I haven't read it yet, but it's on my list. It uh, came out about 10, 15 years ago called Out Beyond Sea. And one of the things it talked about was uh, the borders area. So if you're a Scottish criminal, you could go commit a crime in England, and then go back across Scotland, and there was no jurisdiction, and vice versa. So the borders area was about as close to anarchy as you could possibly get. And the Washingtons were probably closer to the borders than they were to what we think of as, as proper England, because England has grown on the map. England wasn't always as big as it is now. Um, so Washington, being a planter and surveyor and all that, he took his economic advice from Alexander Hamilton, which is probably why he um, supported a, a, a national bank. But when it came to political theory, the guy that was the guy was James Madison. And James Madison put himself completely at Washington's disposal. So if you were basing yourself on the old race theory, you say, hey, Washington's an Englishman. Uh, he's a six foot, some odd inch tall redhead from the borders area, and he, got, and, and he decided how to put government together according to what James Madison told him. And James Madison was if there should be a statue to anybody in Washington, it is Madison. We have so underrated him, and and he was very good friends with Jefferson. We've got a, a statue of Jefferson, but Madison was a little guy, very sickly as a youth, so he stayed in the house and did nothing but study all the history of the world as a youth. This guy knew everything, and and, ev and, and everything we ever were and became, we could credit to him. Now, what happens when you see? In the, in, in the industrial area in the 1880s, the old agrarian Jefferson Madison idea doesn't fit what big business and big labor want. And so what happens is, oh, well, Alexander Hamilton wanted a national bank. And so big business starts this apotheosis of Hamilton as the architect of the Constitution. And so you'll occasionally hear something, well, wasn't Madison just a note taker? 
if Madison was just the note taker, you are wholeheartedly subscribing to the 1880s propaganda of the, of, of the war between big business and big labor. Because what comes out of that is then there's a, a Marxist guy named Charles Beard who prints a book in 1912 or 1913, and he basically tries to say, well, the founders were just a bunch of uh, uh, rich guys trying to protect their assets, and there was no theory behind the Constitution. Um, so all of that comes out of something else. So Madison was really Washington's oracle. In fact, if, I'll look it up real quickly because the one of the biographers, James Thomas Flexner, was a biographer of Washington, and um, so I used his words rather than mine. Um, what Flexner said about Washington is he found in Madison qualities infinitely more valuable. As long as Madison greatly admired another man and how he greatly admired Washington, he placed almost selflessly his wisdom at his idol's disposal. And that wisdom comprised what the United States now most needed, a widely examined and deeply meditated knowledge of the machinery of government. And so when you understand that Madison's understanding was everything of the compact ideal that Witherspoon had taught him, he was with, not, he not only went to Princeton, after Princeton, he stayed at Princeton to study even more under Witherspoon. So when Madison comes home, he is the greatest fount of knowledge that, Pres uh, that, that Princeton can possibly give. And, he, and you can see throughout the Constitution. I think one of, the, one of the things I didn't mention, and I think this speaks volumes, every major proposal at the Constitutional Convention, with the exception of the Three-Fifths Clause, because they're Presbyterians, they wouldn't have believed in that, every single one is by e either from a Princeton graduate or a protege of a Princeton graduate. So when you look at the Virginia plan, Madison got to the convention early, he writes the Virginia plan. The Randolphs, because their family, the, the big family, Randolph is the one who submits it. The Connecticut Compromise was written by Oliver Ellsworth, graduate of Princeton. The New Jersey plan was written by William Patterson, a graduate of Princeton. The guys that came out of Princeton wholeheartedly knew the idea of Scottish compact theory believed in it thoroughly. So if you look, one of the only, probably the only Scottish state that ended up approving the Constitution first time around was New Jersey. That's because all the guys in New Jersey had gone to Princeton, and they all knew what the Scottish Compact Theory meant. The guys in the backwoods of North Carolina, and Virginia, and South Carolina were afraid that the government was too centralized, and that's why they held out for a Bill of Rights. And you see that in New Hampshire and, and Massachusetts also. Well, all the guys that were in New Jersey that had all gone to Princeton, they're like, we understand it. We, we've been there. We've taken the course from Mr. Witherspoon, and they went along with it. So Washington, ethnically English, but I don't think that's import as important, is the fact that culturally he got his advice from Madison, and he believed that these guys, and there's an Ulster historian, I have not been able to find the original source of the quote, but I put it in my book anyway, um, who we were talking about the British coming. He says, I've defeated everywhere else. I'll take my last stand in my native Virginia with the Scotch-Irish of the Shenandoah Valley. Um, because he believed in liberty. So um, obviously he wasn't part of the Tory mindset. And so I put him in here as one of those guys that we always, just because of his ethnicity, classify as English. But really his ideas were the ideas of Madison. Yes, ma'am. I have a question about the Covengers and John Knox. Uh -huh. How do they fit into it? They are Presbyterian. So what, ha so what happens if you go, depending on how far you go back, um, you know, I've got some Catholic friends today that if I say Roman Catholic, I'm like, well, Roman Catholic is only uh, uttered by those people that don't like the Catholic. And I said, no, you got to remember, I'm Scottish, I'm Irish, I'm Welsh. There was a Celtic Catholic Church. And so the big fight between the Celtic Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic Church was again about power structures. So if you look at the word abbey, like today, the Catholic Church has changed a lot. So if you look at today, you'll hear about a bishop or you'll hear about an abbey. Well, way, way back when, that was the difference. So the, the Celtic Catholic Church used to actually send missionaries to the continent to try and convert people away from Roman Catholicism because the Celtic Catholic Church maintained that you should just be, you should capture your community for Christ. That's what they believed. And so they were set up on an abbey system. The supreme power in the town was, was an abbot. Whereas in 
Roman Catholic Church, they had bishoprics where you could get out and get more territory and, and, and set it up. So what happens is you've got the dark period, you come out of the dark period of history, and when I say dark, I don't mean that it was lesser, people were dumber than just, it wasn't all written down, we're not as aware of, of those few centuries as we are of some of the other ones. And so what happens is when this fight between the people on the continent want to export what we would call slavery to the islands and, and, and over everything, there's a group of people that say we need to revive the cold days, and those people are the Presbyterians. And so when you look at how Presbyterianism uh, comes up as a form of church governance, because they subscribe to the old cold E idea that everything is local. Um, and they, they, don't, they don't want the big power structure. So you can start to see where if the nobles are saying we don't want a divine right monarch, and the, the people with religion are saying we want to go back to the way of the cold knees, and we don't want bishoprics here, and where everything, absolutely everything is locally controlled. So the clan chief, you know, if the chief of your clan was your military leader, he was your judge. Now, in the Celtic society, they would say, well, come, I'm the judge, and I'm going to make the judgment, but they bring people in, and they say, what do you know about the situation? Well, what do you know about it? And then you take that. So he would be the final arbiter, but he usually did it with the council to keep peace within the clan. So everything in the clan, right down to religion, was local. Um, and so when you see John Knox, uh, you know, a lot of that, where the French come in and they siege St. Andrews and they take Knox the galley slave, bless you. Um, all of that is still about the power structure, not so. The, they take George Wishart, who is not a street dream partner. They burn him in the stake. Then they siege St. Andrews. They take John Knox, a galley slave. All of this is about whether or not there's going to be a state church the way the French have. Is Scotland going to become a colony of France or not? Is there going to be a state church? Or are we going to be Presbyterians that follow the model of the cold deed? And that's got. That's got nothing to do with the theology, although because of the way things felt, Presbyterianism does become a Calvinist, does have Calvinism as its theology. But it's important to realize really what Presbyterian is, and it reflects everything about those countries that were never conquered by Rome. That this is our community. We worship our God in our way. Um, you know, we want to rule our own locality. Um, so John Knox fits right into that, you know, he calls Mary Queen of Scots a French whore. Now, most people are like, oh, look how awful John Knox is. That's an example of, of how extreme he was. But let's go back to Scotland at the time. Her father dies. She goes to France. She's raised in France. When she comes back, she doesn't speak the Scottish tongue. She speaks the French tongue. She doesn't go by Mary. She goes by Marie because it's French. Everything about her is French, and she's been made that way because of the Francophile court that has surrounded her. So when Mary, Queen of Scots, comes back, I mean, from the Jacobite, they're like, oh, she was our queen, we should have supported her. There's a reason why the Scots turned her over to Elizabeth, um, because that was not the opinion of Scotland at the time. And Scottish patriots didn't want to be a colony of France any more than they wanted to be a colony of England. They wanted independence. They believed in their own sovereignty. So the when I went down that list, Covenanters, Ulster, Scott, Scotch Irish, you can put uh, you can put Covenanter and John Knox right in there. When Andrew Melville writes the Second Book of Discipline and he shakes King James, the reason why Andrew Melville wrote the Second Book of Discipline is because John Knox has just died. So John Knox writes the First Book of Discipline, he dies. Andrew Melville finishes the Second Book of Discipline, and then does the Two Kingdoms theory. That, that's what I said. He has. He has. <laughs> <laughs>